Um, about a year ago, I published a book called Post-Truth, in which I argued that we now live in a world in which lying is rampant and accountability is often absent. In 2016, the Oxford Dictionaries defined post-truth as, quote, denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief, end quote. In its most virulent form, this can lead to the political subordination of reality, where ideology takes precedence over facts, and we're expected to tolerate such nonsense as that it didn't rain on Trump's inauguration, even though it did, or that the murder rate is rising, even when FBI statistics say that it's falling. That's the shocking situation of our present political reality. But it didn't come out of nowhere. As I argue in Post-Truth, one of its main roots can be found in 60 years of science denial, from the tobacco industry's 1950s public relations campaign against the link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer, to the intelligent design theorists' attacks on evolution by natural selection, to the current outrage over the faux skepticism and misunderstanding that's led to so much public confusion over the truth about climate change. Clearly, we need a better way to fight back, not only against the metastasis of post-truth, but against the science denial from whence it came. In doing so, I wonder whether we might look to scientists for help. Not necessarily. Now, there are probably some scientists in the room whom I just insulted. In saying this, I mean no disrespect. I believe that science is wonderful and that scientists as a whole are exemplars of what it means to defend the idea that facts matter in the search for truth. It's just that in graduate school, scientists are taught to become expert researchers, but almost none are trained in effective public communication. Likewise, scientists are rarely trained in the logical or methodological roots of their disciplines and may subscribe to a view that philosophers call naive realism, which holds that science simply discovers the truth. When called on to defend their results, some scientists may therefore be tempted to present their findings as fact and seem shocked when an audience of doubters don't believe them. But you don't convince somebody who doesn't believe in evidence by presenting them with more evidence. You do it, if at all, by helping them to improve their reasoning, enter the philosophy of science. You saw that coming because I'm a philosopher of science. <laughs> For the last hundred years, the philosophy of science has engaged in furious debate over what's distinctive about science. They spend a lot of time talking about method and trying to come up with some sort of logical criteria by which we could separate science from non-science to settle once and for all why scientific theories have a special claim to believability. But largely, we've failed. Even on its own terms, most philosophers of science now admit that the demarcation problem probably can't be solved. As a consequence, philosophy hasn't done much to contribute to the defense of science in recent years. And this has led some scientists to come to the conclusion that philosophy of science isn't really very useful to them. Uh, you hear quotations from Sheldon Glashow, from Steven Weinberg, et cetera, uh, uh, dis disrespecting the philosophy of science. My very favorite is from the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman, who memorably said, philosophy of science is about as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. <laughs> so there's enough sting in that remark to make it hurt, but perhaps we've just been going about it wrong. I'll also say that science is currently under attack, and now is not the time for scientists to reject help from their allies, or to sniff that everything's going well except for those irrational science deniers who just won't listen. That's exactly the problem. They won't listen. They're not listening. And the blame for this rests at least in part with scientists who are talking to them about it. For one thing, scientists are often too quick to get exasperated and say, this person isn't worth talking to, and then refuse to engage in debate when someone questions their evidence. I think it's understandable that somebody who's devoted their entire life to the power of experiment and facts would grow impatient with those who'd thoughtlessly question their data, or even accuse them of lying or fraud. Yet another part of the problem is that scientists' own conception of what they're doing occasionally gives aid and comfort to some of the most prevalent myths that are held by science deniers. Science deniers often believe that it's a scientist's job to prove a result, that we must therefore be certain of a finding before we're justified in believing it. 
that anything less is, quote, just a theory. Science deniers use these myths to shore up their conclusion that until the day comes when scientists reach absolute certainty, any hypothesis is just as credible as any other, except that this day will never come, and scientists know it. So why then do scientists sometimes lie when confronted with a room full of doubters and pretend that their results have been proven, that vaccinations carry no risk, that their models of climate change have been conclusively verified? The problem is that most scientists don't know how to admit such things and still offer a robust defense of science. But what if they did? What if the defense of science could be more honest and based on the idea that the openness and uncertainty of science is a strength instead of a weakness? That of course we don't know everything, but this doesn't make it rational to question the well-corroborated findings of science. Science is intrinsically fallible as opposed to deductive logic, where certainty can be reached based on the validity of its form, when you're dealing with an empirical subject, there's always the possibility that your theory is going to be proven wrong by some future data. That's just how inductive reasoning works. Scientists must always allow for the possibility that their conclusions are going to be overturned. In science, one's required to balance both openness to new hypotheses and a reflex to doubt any new, new idea until it's been thoroughly tested. This is what allows us to learn from experience. Science never shuts the books. But it's also why, no matter how good the evidence, we'll never be able to show that vaccines are 100% safe, or that electrons are real, or that smoking causes cancer. Those of you who have studied philosophy already know about the problem of induction which says that any time you move from some pattern in an area that you do know, and you try to project it into some area that you haven't yet experienced, it may not work. Uh, they tried this before. Think about uh, when Einstein replaced Newton, who thought that that was going to happen. For logical reasons, there's just no way you can get science to offer deductive certainty. And this problem has flummoxed philosophers of science for the last two centuries. And despite many attempts, no one has ever found a way to resolve it. That does not mean that science has no solid basis. Even if science is based on inductive reasoning and its claims can never be 100% proven, this does not mean that any belief is as good as any other, uh, nor that there's no such thing as likelihood given the evidence. It's just that perhaps the basis for what's distinctive about science isn't rooted in logic or in method, but instead in the attitude that scientists use to approach their explorations. Although this may not solve the problem of demarcation, it does allow for one of the most powerful ways that we can defend the unique authority of science. Now, it's sometimes held to be an anathema to the philosophy of science to talk about values rather than facts. There's this fact-valued distinction uh, intrinsic in the philosophy of science. But that's precisely what I'm going to do next, because I think that in the end it's the norms and attitudes of science that make it special. I call my thesis here simply the scientific attitude, and it has two parts. First, that scientists care about evidence. Second, that they're open to using this evidence to change their beliefs. It's the second part that really matters, because this is what allows scientists to distinguish themselves from science deniers and pseudoscientists. With climate change deniers, anti-evolutionists, and anti-vaxxers, their beliefs are not customarily based on evidence, but on ideology. If they use evidence at all, they do so only selectively, normally to support their beliefs, rather than to test them. Instead of changing their mind based on evidence, they look for ways to show that they're right. This is not what scientists do. It's not that scientists are perfect or that they never make mistakes. They suffer from the same cognitive biases as the rest of us. And in individual cases, surely they prefer that their own theories are true. But here's the thing. In science, we don't let them get away with that. Their colleagues check up on them. The scientific attitude is judged not just by how individual scientists feel about their work, whether they think they have the scientific attitude, but rather on the basis of a shared ethos of critical scrutiny and empirical testing that's reflected in the community practices of science. Like the rest of us, scientists face uncertainty. It's just that they've developed a system of checks and procedures to help them deal with doubt and uncertainty in a rational manner. 
In my new book, The Scientific A Attitude, I explore one of my favorite examples of this, which is how Ignaz Semmelweis, who was a lowly assistant physician in Vienna in the 1840s, discovered the cause of childbed fever. Childbed fever, which is a potentially fatal infection in pregnant women, we now know is caused by germs. But germs weren't discovered until the 1850s. At the Vienna General Hospital, pregnant women were separated into two wards. In Ward 1, that was attended by medical students, there was a 29% mortality rate from childbed fever. Whereas in the adjacent Ward 2, that was attended by midwives, if you're a midwife you can clap now, it was only 3%. I know. Now, what was the difference? Semmelweis tried various hypotheses, the position of delivery, the physical layout. My favorite was that uh, every time a woman died in Ward 1, the priest walked in to do last rites and he rang a bell. And Semmelweis thought, maybe this scared people to death. And so he asked the priest not to ring the bell anymore. But of course, it didn't result in any drop in mortality, though it may have made people feel a little bit better temporarily. So what was, the real, uh, uh, what was the real difference? The medical students came to Ward 1 directly from performing autopsies. <laughs> and back in those days, no one washed their hands. Yeah. Semmelweis instituted a program of hand washing and chlorinated water, and the mortality rate fell. He hypothesized that childbed fever was due to the, president, to the presence of putrid matter, duh, uh, on the medical students' hands which was largely correct, even though nobody yet knew why. Think of Darwin uh, before genetics. See, they knew that something was going on, but they didn't know the mechanism, and that's kind of where Semmelweis was. They didn't know about germs, but he knew something was going on. Of course, his ideas were resisted. Semmelweis was fired. Uh, he was committed to an asylum, jailed, <laughs> beaten by his guards, and died of a blood infection not dissimilar to childbed fever. So if you think there are... Uh, scientists today have it tough when they have to have conversations with science deniers. I mean, imagine that. Think of Galileo. Think of Giordano Bruno, burned at the, uh, at the stake. Well, Semmelweis, of course, was later vindicated. But like so many other martyrs for science, his legacy lived on as demonstration of the power of changing one's beliefs based on evidence, which is the essence of the scientific attitude. Now, compare that to the strategy that's embraced by pseudoscientists who, despite their protests that they're skeptics, are often really quite gullible and embrace conspiracy theories for which they have no good evidence. I sometimes make the claim that uh, conspiracy theorists have a double standard for evidence. Uh, nothing can convince them uh, to give up a belief that they want to hold, but no evidence is required for getting them to believe something that they do want to believe. Compare it also to science deniers who profess to care about evidence, then cherry pick only that which suits their preferred ideology. If you talk to your favorite vaccine denier, they'll probably make a claim that there's a governmental cover-up about the dangers of thimerosal, or that a single study, though long ago debunked and now proven to be fraudulent, shows that vaccines cause autism. It's not that science deniers have never been exposed to good evidence. It's that they have no good normative context for knowing how to reason on its basis. And then it occurred to me how to use all of this to fight back against science denial. If you look back at history, you realize that most human belief is based not on evidence, but on social identity. Even in the present day, people seem much more prone to change their minds based on interaction with someone they trust rather than on data. As we know from the work of Daniel Kahneman, who wrote the, the wonderful book, Thinking Fast and Slow, there are numerous cognitive biases that have been wired into human brains for millennia. This makes it all the more remarkable that relatively recently in human history, people like Semmelweis and Galileo came along to champion the idea that evidence matters because it can be used to push us toward the discovery of truths that we would miss if we just followed our ideology or our orthodox beliefs. Now, I saw all of you wince when we talked about the uh, uh, Semmelweis and the cadaveric matter. Because today we think of this, uh, we think of the idea that you change your mind based on evidence as wise and obvious. But for most of human history, our beliefs have been based on what others in our community thought, on authority, on our peer group, peer group and on what we ourselves wanted to believe. And indeed, for many people, 
That's still the way that it works today, which is why I don't think it should be so surprising that science denial is on the rise. There's been an enormous erosion of trust in recent years uh, due to the ex exacerbation of cognitive bias by social media and political partisanship. And this has undermined our willingness to believe in experts. There's another book by uh, uh, Tom Nichols called The Death of Expertise that's really terrific and talks about this. Nonetheless, we seem flummoxed in this post-truth era by a very simple question. Why are people not convinced by facts that are right in front of their face? That, that was an article in uh, The New Yorker. There, there were many articles uh, just after Trump was elected uh, talking about this. The answer, it's okay to laugh. <laughs> the answer is not merely that people are irrational, though they may well be, it's that most people's beliefs aren't revisable by evidence because they were never based on evidence in the first place. For many people, belief isn't about evidence, but the extent to which a belief fits in with something else that they care about. Ideology comes first, reality comes second. Some scientific beliefs threaten a person's identity, and some don't. This is why they pick and choose. Yes, they believe in chemotherapy, but they don't believe in vaccines. Yes, they'll drink, drink pasteurized milk, but they won't touch GMOs. This is a bastardization of the process by which justified beliefs are formed. If you look at it in this way, you can more readily appreciate the enormity of our task, because there are no magic words that you can say to a science denier to convince them. There is no definitive experiment their beliefs are based on what makes them feel part of their community enjoy, and enjoy a sense of belonging. And that community may no longer include scientists. Even empirical beliefs can be tribal. At some level, people would rather believe a lie told by someone that they trust in their group rather than a truth by an outsider. When people say that climate change isn't real, or that vaccines are dangerous, or that the earth is flat, they're not just telling you about their beliefs, they're telling you about their values. They're telling you who they trust. Science denial undermines not just the findings of science, but also the process by which credible, well-justified empirical beliefs are formed in the first place. But it's always been like this. We've been on this planet 100,000, 200,000 years. Science is the exception. We think that science deniers are the weird ones, but really, looked at from an historical perspective, it's science that's the newcomer. It's an awesome thing to have your mind changed by evidence, to have the courage to say, I want to believe that X is true, but the evidence is telling me that X is not true. But as I've said, cognitive bias is just as wired into scientists' brains as it is into anyone else's, so how do they overcome it? I think it's through the scientific attitude. It's an amazing thing that in science there are a set of values that have helped us to overcome these very human tendencies to believe what we want to believe. And perhaps this is what allows scientists to embrace a different identity than the layperson, that of the true skeptic. So what can be done about, by those of us who care about science? I think that we have to teach science deniers a new set of values. Uh, you thought it was hard to convince them with uh, new evidence. Just try teaching them a new set of values. But I think that we have to help them to abandon the myth of certainty in science and explain the important role that evidence has in building warrant for well-justified empirical beliefs. When certainty is the standard, it's easy for science deniers to call themselves skeptics and pretend that they're justified in holding out for proof. How many times have you heard people say, well, that's not settled science, or have you performed the definitive experiment, or that's just a theory? Instead, we have to show them what true skepticism actually means. We have to show them that the scientific attitude is the direct opposite of the mindset that leads to post-truth. In my earlier book, by the way, I did argue that science denial was the pathway that led to post-truth. So what would this look like in practice? Well, funny you should ask. In November 2018, I went to the Flat Earth Conference in Denver, Colorado. I didn't go as a scientist, because I'm not a scientist, I went as a philosopher. If I pulled a gyroscope out of my pocket or I tried to rig up a Foucault's pendulum, they'd just laugh, and I probably would too. 
but also if the flat earthers hadn't been convinced by evidence that's been around for 2300 years since Pythagoras, why would they believe me? And so instead, I sought to talk to them about their reasoning strategy. The flat earthers I met professed that their beliefs were based on evidence. Even though a good deal of them were fundamentalist Christians, they maintained that their beliefs were not faith-based. They talked constantly of doing their own experiments. Yet virtually all of them were conspiracy theorists who believed that NASA had faked the moon landings, that Antarctica wasn't a continent, but was instead spread out as a mountain range around the circumference of the Earth, formed an ice wall so the water doesn't fall off, that all government leaders were in on the attempt to cover up the truth of flat Earth, and that the rest of us had been brainwashed into being what they call globalists in school. Most of them believed in a host of other conspiracy, conspiracy theories, too. Everything from chemtrails to who started the Paradise, California fire, etc. Still, I engaged them in a calm and respectful manner, while remaining adamant in my contention that their beliefs were not only false, but irrationally conceived. For the most part, I let them talk. But then I asked pertinent, razor-sharp question from the philosophy of science that wasn't my question, it was from the eminent philosopher of science 100 years ago, Karl Popper. Instead of asking them, what evidence do you have that your beliefs are true, I asked, what evidence would it take to convince you that you were wrong? A lot of flat earthers were uncomfortable with this question. It seemed like one they'd never heard before. I have to say, they, they talked about experiments, but the nature of the experiments were things like the guy who flew there, um, they believed in air travel, and he kept a carpenter's level on the tray table in front of him, and since the bubble never dipped the whole time, that was his proof that the earth was flat. Yeah. A lot, uh, so it seemed at the end of one of the main scientific talks, uh, scientific talk, I approached the speaker who had made a big deal of the fact that although he had no university credentials, he was wearing a white lab coat, which he said was all the authority he needed. <laughs> and I wanted to ask him a few questions. During his talk, he had presented a photograph of the skyline of the city of Chicago from 60 miles out in Lake Michigan. The trouble was, at that distance, the curvature of the Earth was supposed to have made all of the buildings disappear. So he thought he had his proof. I pushed him on this. How do you know the photo isn't fake, I said. I know the guy who took it, he said. And I went out myself about a year later and I saw the same thing. This is real. During his presentation, this scientist has suggested all sorts of conspiracy theories about how virtually all of the NASA space photos were faked. None could be trusted. Yet he trusted the man who'd taken this particular photo because he knew him. Uh, I shared with him a quick calculation that I'd done based on the numbers he'd provided during his talk. They were not incompetent mathematicians. His math was correct, showing that you only had to go out 45 miles for the top of the Sears Tower to disappear. And he said that was right, but he'd gone out 46 miles, and that the picture was from 60 miles. He scoffed at my suggestion that the whole thing could be explained by the superior mirage effect which is a physical phenomenon whereby, depending on the temperature of the surface of the water relative to the temperature of the air on any given day, what you see in the photo, and you can, it actually is in the photo, is not actually the city of Chicago. It's the superposition of the city of Chicago as a mirage in the sky. It's an optical illusion that you can take a picture of. You've all seen, maybe you've seen it, sometimes the image is upside down. You've all seen the inferior mirage effect if you've ever driven on a hot highway and you think that you see water on it, because there the highway is hotter than the air, so it's the inferior mirage effect. This is the superior mirage effect, where the water is colder than the air, and so it looks like the city of Chicago is hovering up in the sky. So I said, this is an optical illusion, and he laughed. I dealt with that in my talk, he said. It's made up. You didn't deal with it in your talk, I said. You just said you didn't believe it. <laughs> well, I don't, he said. He started to get antsy, and he began to greet his other fans, but I moved in for one final question, just like Columbo. <laughs> so why didn't you go out 100 miles then? What? 100 miles, I said. If you'd gone out that far, not only the city would have disappeared, but also the mirage too. If it didn't, you'd have your proof. Definitive experiment. He shook his head. We couldn't get the captain of the boat to go out that far. 
Now it was my turn to scoff. What? You devoted your entire life to this work and you didn't go? You had the definitive experiment within reach and you couldn't go out an extra 55 miles? He turned away and began to talk to someone else. Of necessity, it's going to be a slow process to talk to science deniers. Science denial didn't take hold overnight and we can't vanquish it overnight either. But I'm convinced that the best way to do it is not to try to ram evidence down someone's throat or to insult them, but to teach them the values of science. And we do that best by trying to embody them, by listening to the science deniers and taking on their points one by one, by engaging with them rather than walking away. I may not have convinced the scientists that day at the Flat Earth Convention, though I trust that some of the others standing nearby must have overheard my objections to what he'd said. But maybe I did begin to build up some trust. Hey, at least I showed up. I took on the worst form of science denial that I could imagine, and I didn't let them get away with lazy thinking or lying unchallenged. I went to the Flat Earth Convention because I wanted to face science denial in its most elemental form. My working hypothesis was that all science deniers use basically the same reasoning strategy. Start with ideology that you're committed to no matter what. Cherry pick evidence in its favor. Exploit uncertainty where you can. Try to discredit those, who's agree, those who disagree with you and cast doubt on their work. Cite your own experts, even if they have no expertise. Claim that you're actually being more scientific than the scientists. Then throw in a little conspiracy theory, and you're done. Climate change denial, anti-vax, anti-evolution, I think they all follow this pattern, which means that if you can figure out how to talk to one of them, you've learned how to fight back against science denial as a whole. That's what I'm working on now for my next book. And in my next stop, I'm going to rural Pennsylvania in September to talk to some coal miners about climate change. That's it. Uh, I don't know what the phenomenon is called, but I think that these uh, science deniers, the step one to being a science denier is not having an ability to say, I don't know. And I think that's a really interesting phenomenon. If somebody asks me a question or you go to man on the street interviews, you can ask them questions and almost everybody will have an opinion on subjects that they probably know nothing about. Why is it that human beings have this tendency to start with needing an explanation instead of just saying, I don't know. I, I think it's part of cognitive bias. Uh, who knows why, why it's there. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, Socrates said that false knowledge was a, a greater danger than ignorance. Because if you're ignorant, you might think, well, now I can learn something. You know, you, you, if you're ignorant, right. you right. presumably know that you're ignorant. Right. But if you have false knowledge, if you think that you know the answer when you don't, then there's trouble. Uh, read uh, Euthyphro, Mino, any other platonic dialogue, and it's the, it's the same story over and over again. I don't know why. I mean, people do think, that it's, it's very hard for people to admit that they don't know. Interestingly, that's what a true skeptic does. True skepticism is about the idea that I don't know, so I'm going to withhold evidence until there's enough belief for me to form it. it but it's that second part that's really important because skepticism doesn't mean that you never believe. It means that when the evidence is sufficient, it's time. They just, Reuters just reported the other day that the evidence for climate change is now at the five sigma level. It's a million to one shot that the science deniers are right. I think we probably reached that level. Thank, Thank you. you. How is uh, science denial and uh, fraud and all that like identity politics? How is it like identity politics? Uh, I think some of it is, um, I, I think some science denial is partisan, uh, not all. Uh, if you look at vaccine denial, it tends to be more bipartisan, but I think that one thing that happens is some science denial topics, climate change is a good one, uh, can, can become partisan and then it's, uh, and then it's whipped up. But identity, I mean, they can be religious identity, uh, uh, political identity, they're different kinds. And I got to thinking about this the other day and I wondered, is there something new? And I finally decided this is not really new, it's just that, you know, you think back to the 1950s 
it's not that people understood scientific evidence better than we do today. It's just that they trusted scientists. And now an awful lot of people don't trust scientists. And why don't they? Because they can go to the internet and find their people. They can not only just find their information, they can find their people who say, oh, you're right, you're absolutely right. Didn't you know that, you know, we didn't go to the moon, et cetera, et cetera. Most flat earthers are radicalized by YouTube videos. So they call it dropping in the, down the rabbit hole, right? So, I mean, that, so that can be identity. You can find identity on the, uh, on the internet as, as well. Uh, so politics is one way to, to find identity, but it can, it can happen in other ways as well, I think. I said a, a little bit more about that in my, in my book, Post-Truth, as well. Yeah. Um, I have a quote here I was hoping you could uh, comment on. This is from Max Planck. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die. And, <laughs> and, a new yeah. and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Is there an example of where people in his history were persuaded that you can think of, that people were just change yeah. their mind? And yeah, uh, there, there are. Uh, I mean, Thomas Kuhn made great hay out of that uh, quotation, too, in, in his book, make, making the argument that this is how paradigms change. The, the old guys with their old ideas die off, and then the, the new come in. Um, and, and, and that's, it's been that way for a long time. You look back at uh, Semmelweis a few years after with uh, Virchow and Lister and some of the other uh, folks who came along. There were people who didn't believe in germs. Uh, and, and no matter what was demonstrated, they wouldn't believe, wouldn't believe, but then they eventually died off and, and the field moved on. It's good news, though, that people can eventually have their mind changed based on evidence, but it has to be done in the right way. There's empirical, there are empirical studies, uh, one by uh, James Kuklinski, one by David Redlosk, uh, one by Brendan Nyan, which talks about how to convince people. Um, it helps not to insult them. Uh, it helps to be respectful and to listen. Sometimes just listening uh, can help to change somebody's mind because they, they want to be heard. Uh, right now with the, the anti-vax crisis going on in Washington State, so I grew up in Portland, Oregon, right across the river from Vancouver, Washington, which is kind of a hot spot right now for anti-vax. And I was reading in the Washington Post the other day that um, they're sending out public health officials to have workshops to talk with people, sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. And this is working. Mm. People are changing their mind. I think that the, the empirical research has shown that the way to change people's mind is to build trust, to talk to them, to engage with them. That's what I try to do at the Flat Earth Convention. Now, that's hard to do when there's 600 of them and, and one of me, and they're also getting all the peer reinforcement uh, you know, for, from the other people at the convention. I, I joked when, with my wife that I needed to separate one of the gazelles from the herd, maybe, and I could convince somebody, right? So, that, I mean, that, maybe that works, but, you know, if you listen to what people's objections are and you let them talk, and then you feed in the evidence where you can, that works. They're, they're, I, I'm now a connoisseur of the sub-literature of people who have changed their mind about vax, climate change, flat earth, et cetera. And it's always, ba the, the way that it happens is that they talk to somebody that they trust who presents them with evidence. That's just, that's how it's done. And that's part of the message I'm trying to get out to scientists, that if they just stay in their labs and, and be right, this problem's gonna get worse. And it's not like it was when I was gr growing up where, yeah, some people believe we hadn't gotten to the moon and maybe they weren't hurting anybody. Now, I think that we're creating a culture of denial that is not unrelated to what's happening in Washington, D.C. Because, as I said in my book, Post-Truth, if you can deny the truth about cigarette smoking and lung cancer, if you can deny the truth about climate change, you can deny the truth about how many people were at an inauguration or anything else you want. Right. Thank you. I got from Max Planck to Trump, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. So, um, maybe you cover this in your book, but... Um, I think it's even worse than what you said. Oh, no. if, you're, if your identity is based on a set of a worldview, like yeah. flat earth or whatever it might be, then in a lot of ways, the more facts contradict your worldview, the more you're going to grab onto the worldview yeah. and to hell with the facts because That's right. you know, 
that if you lost your your, your tribe, your, your yeah. everything goes out the window. You, and you lose then you lose you? everything. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's uh, Brendan Nyan did a stu an earlier study uh, on something that you may have heard of called the backfire effect, where he found that people would, uh, when presented who had false beliefs, when presented with evidence that their beliefs were false, doubled down. That is, it would the false evidence reinforced their false belief, right. which was sort of incredible. And here's the, the scary part. The more educated they were, the worse the effect was. So from the, the question before about the, the false knowledge, because they, they were better reasoners, better arguers. They, they knew a thing or two, and they thought they could, could uh, defend their views. Um, even if what you say is true, I think that makes it all the more important that we fight back against science denial. Because every lie has an audience. And if you're not confronting the science denier, you're giving that person the stage. You're giving that person the microphone to convince other people. And I saw it at the Flat Earth Convention when I was arguing with that guy who had just gotten off the stage. I'm never going to convince him. His identity is with the white lab coat and you know, up there on stage. That's who he is. It's part of who he is. But just by being there and witnessing the lie, I felt like I was making a, a strike for truth against some of the people who were listening. If we, if we don't stand up for truth, it gets worse and worse and worse until we're just waiting for people to die. And, how, and guess what? These are our uh, fellow citizens who are voting just the same as we are, and I don't think we can let things get that far. As I said, it creates a culture of denial which, and you might think, well, the flat earthers aren't hurting anybody, but climate change deniers certainly are, anti-vaxxers certainly are, and I think that if people who believe one, the, the, the leading characteristic for believing in a conspiracy theory is to believe in other conspiracy theories. It's the most virulent form of reasoning I think there is, and I want, if nothing else, I wanted to confront the flat earthers just to say, um, you know, to, to talk about the double standard for evidence with their conspiracy theories, because it's, it's dangerous. Thank you. So if we are hardwired to be ideological beings, yeah. uh, and that makes the truth inconvenient for us, yeah. how do we ask scientists to understand that part of what makes that new truth hard is that science is expensive and that it is not on a schedule? It's mm -hmm. not ritualized. The truth could take 100 years to find yeah. or 100 days. I, I don't know how to answer that question. It's except to say that we just do, do the best that we can. I mean, sci scientists, so look, we're, we're not a slave to our cognitive wiring, to, to whatever our starter set is. Um, human beings are capable of, uh, through education, uh, through just different value sets, changing what their hard wiring is. I mean, the, the cognitive bias that's in our brains is there for a reason. It's built in by evolution because it served a purpose. But that doesn't mean that it's destiny. Um, we're probably hardwired to kill our enemies when nobody's looking, if we think we can get away with it. It's a good evolutionary strategy. But very few people do it because, I hope, because we're presumably raised to be better than that. We're raised to, in a, with a moral education. I think that if we're raised with an education in the values of science, it could help us with some of the other cognitive biases. Um, I remember when I was taught science in school, in elementary school, they never taught the process. They taught the findings. And they made it sound like it just all of a sudden truth dropped from the sky and weren't we lucky to live in the day in which all truth had been discovered? And then from that point of view, it's very easy to indulge the idea that, well, yes, yeah, science is about proof and certainty because scientific revolutions take a long time. And I think that one thing that I've argued for is that they need to teach critical thinking in school. To young ages, I think they need to teach philosophy to young kids. I'm always in favor of teaching more philosophy. But I think that they need to change the way that they teach science. Because if they continue to just teach science with the old, well, here's scientific method, here's what they found, look at all these genius people, look at all the idiots who oppose them, they're, they're not really doing a, a good job. I think they need to teach school children about uncertainty 
and testing and uh, peer review and data sharing. Data sharing, that's a value. Peer review, subjecting your idea to public scrutiny. Replication, that's a value. Uh, I've taken some heat from my colleagues in the philosophy of science because I'm talking about values, not method, not logic. I think that's what's special about science and that's what we need to educate people about. The flat earthers, it's not just that they have the wrong findings, it's that they didn't understand the values of science. When the guy wouldn't tell me um, what would convince him that he was wrong, that's a values problem. Thanks. Yeah. Um, given that um, in, in many faiths, especially Christianity, that the apocalypse is, is you know, impending, yeah. and that um, Christopher Hitchens was talking about this, that, yeah, that, they, they, that they're, they're sort of, they, they, they want to bring it on. Um, yeah. I wonder how much, uh, and, and sort of the idea of dominionism, I wonder how much of um, climate denial is sort of apocalyptic in nature? What have you encountered? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, um, some of it. Uh, you, you don't read a lot about this in the media, but you do now and then in some of the folks that I've talked to, you will sometimes hear a strain that we don't need to spend all this money to figure out how to save the planet because the rapture will have come by then. Uh, is it even happening because the Lord, the Lord indicates that this is what he wants to happen? So sure. Right. I mean, I mean so, so you, you, do, you do hear that. But I have to say that I've talked to just as many Christians who have said, we're stewards of the earth, and we should take better care of it than that. Interesting thing about the flat earthers, most of them that I spoke to were not climate change deniers. Now, that was really strange. Uh, no, no, I mean it, because if you believe in one conspiracy theory, you know, and, I, and I just maybe my prejudice that I thought that they would be climate change deniers, but do you know why? It was because they believe that there's a dome, and we're living in this giant terrarium, and we'd better take care of what's inside the dome. Um, I guess I also sort of, going in there, wondered if there was going to be a political split, if, if it was partisan in some way. Not that I could tell. Um, they flashed a picture of Donald Trump holding a globe and thought that he was in on the globalist conspiracy. So they, they were not MAGA people, but because they, they did not like Trump because they thought like every other world leader, he had been paid off in some way through having this extraordinary power that was given to him by whomever in order to keep the secret about the, uh, the flat earth. Yeah. Yes. Do you think that there's also a, an economic connection in the sense that um, with people convinced that an educated political class and an educated financial class have conspired to screw them over, yeah. that also an educated political yeah. class, an educated scientific class is, conjuring, is conspiring to screw them over? Yeah, I mean, you, you hear that sometimes. Sometimes it's, uh, it's cons you hear this in climate change denial sometimes, uh, complaints about elitism amongst scientists that, that they're, uh, but, but again, remember that this is, this is a conspiracy theory, okay? It's, it, it, it's a part of that. But I mean, so, yeah, I, I think there are many threads to it. it that I think you bring up a good point. Uh, the, the money part uh, can certainly be part of it, though not always. If you look back at the campaign against, um, the link between cigarette smoking and cancer. That was engineered by the tobacco companies back in the 1950s. There was just about to be a report on this, a scientific study, and they called in a public relations expert and met to decide what to do, and he told them, fight the science. They started a precursor of the American Tobacco Institute. They took out full-page ads in the newspapers and manufactured doubt where there wasn't any. Uh, Naomi Oreska's terrific book, Merchants of Doubt, talks about this. So sometimes, and, and with climate change, uh, yes, of course. There, there, I think, to begin with at least, there was somebody who decided to make this a partisan issue and that somebody probably was going to make a little profit uh, from this. The interesting part of that, though, is remember, there's the lie and then there's the audience for the lie. Um, most people who are climate change deniers are not making a penny off of it. It just becomes the ideology. It's, even if it started through money, right. it then gets out into the culture 
uh, or becomes politicized, becomes partisan. I think that some climate change deniers just feel like, well, I have to be a climate change denier because that's what my, my party says. And they're, they're not making any money off of it. They may not even know the arguments. They just, as a reflex, know what to say. I think a difference may be that when the tobacco thing started and gained momentum, um, there was not the distrust of the banks and the financial establishments. No, but, but, but that, that happened next. And, and Oreskes makes, uh, and Conway, who co-wrote the book, make a terrific case that that was the blueprint for science denial for the next 50 years. The, the, the same thing that they did in that room over, uh, over cigarette smoking and cancer is almost exactly what happened 50 or 60 years later with climate change denial. So my question is internet related, kind of an opinion, twofold. Um, do you think we, um, as advocates for science, mm -hmm. um, we should engage online with all the extremism? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, so look, in there. <laughs> if I can go to the Flat Earth Convention, right? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yes, I, I think it's okay. I mean, I've I've got some friends who are uh, trolls. Right, they'll go into the websites and kind of to, to, to make fun, and you know, I, I don't advocate that. I think, I mean, you get kicked out of the group sometimes if you let them know who you are. But but I think it's okay. Uh, I I think it's all right. I mean, as as angry as people can get, um, I I think I think they get angrier at the anonymity online. Uh, I I've gotten worse comments online than I get face to face. Okay, I don't know what's coming here, but I mean, but but I do I do get much worse pushback uh, online. Okay. So I've got a piece, as she said, as Olivia said at the beginning, I got a piece coming out in Newsweek. Um, in uh, 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 it's going to be on newsstands June seventh, called Flat Earth and the Rise of Science Denial in America. I'm going to get some pushback on that. I'm 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 sure. So you know, <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's good to engage. I, I I do because I think if it's done in a respectful way, it's really the only way to convince anybody and to show others who are not yet convinced, who are just kind of the doubters, not the deniers, the ones who are uh, hesitant. They now say vaccine hesitant rather than vaccine denier. Who wants to be classified as a denier? I think that's the way to t to talk to folks. Okay, and so with with. That said, and the extremism, this is more of an opinion. Do you think mm -hmm. anything online, do you think the internet should be regulated in some way? Um, you don't so it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard question, but I faced this question a year ago when I was doing my book, Post Truth, because there the question is more overt about fake news. You know, does the First Amendment protect the ability to uh, create dissension where there, you know, in all the ways that we know? <laughs> that happened in the 2016 election. I just read something the other day that the, a part of the current Russian hacking attack, a cyber attack in the United States, is over vaccines. That they're, they're, they're trying to, uh, again, uh, you know, look for opportunities. So can, should it be, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't know if I, if I want to answer that, but, but I do have an opinion on this. Could it be? Yes. Because some people have claimed, no, the internet couldn't possibly be regulated. This would be impossible. It couldn't happen. Uh, I ask you a question. When was the last time you saw porn on Facebook? The answer is never. Nobody's ever seen porn on Facebook because they police for it. They have a crew working on this that is so good that you have never seen porn on Facebook. Could they do the same thing with fake news? Yes, they could. But their values are not such that they do that. Now, I'll leave it to you to question, answer the question, should they do that? But could they do that? Yes, they could. Yeah. So I really love the question, um, what would change your mind? Yeah, it's Karl Popper's question, not mine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's important to me because it's part of my identity, and it's part of the reason that I'm part of this group. So let's try it. What would it take to change your mind that mm. uh, an attitude of science is how we should be evaluating our observations? Okay, so I thought you were going to ask me what would change my mind on flat earth, and I'm going to tell you they tried, because that, I would have been a big get, right? And the one guy I took out to dinner, and I said, uh, you know, for two hours we talked about flat earth, and he was really sharp, and I liked him. 
And he said, okay, but I'm going to try to convince you why you're convincing me. But you asked me something different, which was, what would it take to convince me that the thesis for my book is wrong? Um, let me see. Somebody would have to somebody would have to make the case that that the scientific attitude was uh, was not actually um, th that there was so much corruption in the way that scientists embrace a scientific attitude that it didn't really explain what was special about science. I I, I mean I came upon this idea because I thought that we were talking about the wrong thing for what was special about science, but also because it seemed to me that this was something that most scientists embraced. And in the subtitle, I talk about fraud. In the book, I talk about fraud because the ultimate betrayal of the scientific attitude are scientists who commit fraud because they say that they're going to believe it, and then they don't. So I guess if fraud were more widespread, then that might cause me to, uh, to rethink it. It's a good question, though. I like, I'm a philosopher. I like a good, sharp question. Thank you. Now, what does your shirt say? Vaccines cause adults. Adult. Okay. <laughs> Amazon. Um, so part of the problem, I'm short. Okay. okay. Okay, there we go. So part of the problem in education um, is in a lot of ways we sort of perpetuate a lot of myths that are out there. Yes. Um, super popular one is learning styles. Totally a myth, and any scientist will get, it's been debunked over and over and over again. I know there's like 20 people in here who like, or want to scream at me that I'm wrong, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> but so we teach that, right? We teach it to new teachers, we teach it to kindergartners, and so people grow up sort of believing things without ever looking into it. Um, and then another thing that's kind of coming, and I, I'm a teacher, so I, I know this to be true. Um, another thing, you know, as I'm a science teacher, and I was told a while back that I need to make sure that I'm honoring students' science knowledge when they come in, even if they believe the Earth is 6,000 years old and flat. I'm supposed to honor that and say that it's yeah. one model of the universe. Like how? Ooh, yeah, that no, is, I'm not even kidding. That, that, is, that is very dangerous. I was told that um, by a high-level administrator. <clears throat> Um, and so, like, how do you deal with that kind of thing when, I mean, I don't even know how to deal with that. Like, Well, it, it's, it's a problem, and you're at the tip of the spear with what I think is a national problem. Is this still on? Can you still hear me? Of, of what's a national problem. Um, one of the most upsetting sessions that I went to at the Flat Earth Convention, Flat, Flat Earth International Conference, by the way, it's not the Flat Earth Society. They, they hate them. Okay? It's like the People's Front of Judea and the Judean People's Front. They hate each other. Okay? So I went to Flat Earth International Convention. Um, they had a seminar on recruiting people, and part of it was recruiting kids. And one dad was complaining, you know, what should I do about my daughter, who every time they, in, uh, you know, in school, she was about third grade, uh, she brings up Flat Earth, the other kids laugh at her and ridicule her, and then the teacher dismisses her. And, and, and the advice from the podium was, when the teacher's not looking, take them outside and recruit them on the playground. So, this, obviously, this is a problem. Now, what happens when it makes its way into your classroom, okay? Uh, a few years back, not that many years back, there was a court case in which um, they were trying to get intelligent design taught in public schools. Teach the controversy, because it sounds so fair-minded, okay? Um, in the court case, which normally doesn't have philosophers to testify in court cases, there was a philosopher, uh, Michael Roos, who testified about what was special about science. And the judge found that intelligent design theory was not scientific. Okay? And so, uh, and then incredibly later, another court case, another, you know, th this continues to be tested. I don't think it's that many years before the flat earthers run for school board and try to get teach the controversy over flat earth taught. Here's what I want to say. There are alternative empirical views. The ones that are in the science classroom are the ones that have earned their way there through evidence, okay? Science is not required to kick in the door every time somebody has an alternative hypothesis. If there's evidence, Maybe it merits investigation. But just because somebody has a theory doesn't mean that it deserves to be taught in school. So I don't envy you in the spot that you're in because, uh, but I mean, you might just find a way to push back against your administrator, your principal. To, oh, no, to I, I said I'm not doing that. 
to, to, to say, well, I, I, but I, I think it's a, I think, I, and I understand why you might not, but I mean, I think it's an important point. I wish I could talk to them to say that um, just the idea that not everything belongs in the science classroom because not everything has gone through the rigor of the process that science goes through. And respecting differences of political opinion is one thing, uh, but respecting different theories on empirical matters that uh, are fairly definitively shown through the consensus of scientists, that's a very different kettle of fish. Thank you. Hi. I'm glad I'm not in her place. <laughs> Um, you were talking about how it would be useful to teach not just science in school, but the scientific method. And it occurred to me that perhaps um, continental drift, which has just really been discovered in my lifetime, okay. and doesn't seem to have any stakeholders on one side or the other. Well, not now. Yeah. But it sure did. Oh, did it? Oh, yeah. No. Because, the, you know, the cores and so forth that proved it and, you know, how that, uh, within people's lifetimes, without yeah. scientists having to die. No, no, you, you, you bring up, you'd bring up a terrific point because one, one, one problem that I face, so I'm, I'm trying to defend my, it's a good question, one thing that I'm trying to defend in my book is the idea that what happens when individual scientists don't have the scientific attitude? Well, the community practices, the, the testing tries to correct them. But then what happens when you've got that single individual who's right and the profession is wrong? And this is what the science deniers love. Ted Cruz says he's the new Galileo on climate change, right? Uh, what do you do? And, I, and, and I, I didn't look at continental drift, but I looked at another geological case from about the same time. Uh, from Washington State, in fact, uh, Harlan Bretz, uh, went out to the, the scab lands out in uh, uh, eastern Washington. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's an amazing landscape where you find these um, geological structures that really cannot be explained through the erosion of small amounts of water over time, not, not the gradualism. So Brett's uh, uh, hypothesized that there was a catastrophic flood, and he was right. But at the time, the profession just excoriated him for this because this was when they were fighting back against all of the catastrophes in biology. And the last thing they wanted to do was to give aid and comfort to catastrophes. And so even though Brett's had the evidence for why these little pebbles were way up on top of these cones of rock and why you found these plunge pools with these enormous falls and this tiny little trickle of water or the shape of the canyons, which could only be explained by a tremendous amount of water. They, they, re they resisted him, in not unlike, I mean, they, did, they didn't burn him at the stake or, you know, have him killed or something, right? But, I mean, he did face resistance. And so it's a, it's a good question what, what to do about that. And I make the argument in the book that there are times when the profession does not have the scientific attitude, when momentarily the profession is wrong and the individual is right. And it's happened, Galileo, Harlan, uh, Harlan Bretz, Semmelweis, it's happened a few times. Um, and, but I, I wanted to explore that because I think that it's important not to make the claim that science is perfect, that it always gets it right, but also to show that the difference between a denier who's saying, well, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm that one in a million, and somebody like Harlan Bretz, is he had the evidence. There, he, Bretz wasn't just saying, well, maybe I'm right, because I could be, because he could be. He was saying he was right because he had gone there for a decade and had studied the evidence. Yeah. So thank you for taking the time and dedicating your life to this topic. It's <laughs> okay. something that happens every year at the holidays for me. I wonder more and more about. Oh, on Thanksgiving, kind of yeah. Oh, yeah it's My, Thanksgiving, oh uh, boy. There's somebody ought to write a book called What to Say right? Over I, Thanksgiving I, I buy, Dinner I buy 10 copies to Uncle to Joe, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so it takes a lot of time to do what you're doing. Yeah. And you use the virus metaphor a lot in terms of thoughts that go viral. And as many doctors would tell you, you often have limited time to save the patient when it comes to a yeah. virus. So 
but things <laughs> like climate change, yeah. where they're actually starting to have an impact on society, and we see ecological collapse and things like that. What's your view on the amount of time we have left to convince these people as a minority? You know, you mentioned scientists are sort of a minority compared to all of history. Yeah. What's your view on, like, the clock is ticking, you know? How long do we have to I, solve I, this problem? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, whether we're going to make it or not, I think the only thing we can do is try. Uh, and that, that's really when I got out of my study and started going to things and, and do, facing it, you know, putting myself out there because I felt like I can't ask science to do, scientists to do this if I'm not doing it. And I, and I just kind of, you remember that New Yorker cartoon years ago about the guy who's at his computer and uh, his wife is there and he says, I'll, I'll, I'll be to bed in a minute. Somebody said something wrong on the internet. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like that. I'll kind of keep going after them. And not, not everybody is wired up like that, okay? So, so I kind of, you know, I don't just tolerate the crazy. I pursue it, okay? And not, not everybody's like that. But I, I think that it's required to, uh, as I said, to, to engage, to do something. How long we have, I mean, the, the most, the models that I've seen say that we need to cut um, carbon emission by half by 2030 and cut it to uh, zero by, is it 2050? I can't remember what the most recent numbers are, but it's, it's hard. It's also hard because the, the main uh, uh, scientists who are gathering data are US government scientists who are now subject to political pressure to suppress their work. I just read the other day in the New York Times that they were now, uh, they were, there's a proposal, I don't know whether it's gone through, that government scientists are forbidden from making their climate models go out past 2040. No, because nobody wants to see how bad things are going, going to get. I wish I had the number off the top of my head. Maybe somebody uh, in here knows. Is it, it's half by 2030 and zero by 2040? Is that the, the, the most recent uh, numbers? But not long. I think we've got, uh, I, I, I think we don't have long. I want to I wanna say something optimistic, though. People can change their mind quickly when they have a personal stake in it. Uh, one of my very favorite stories about the how do you get people to change their mind was the governor of, uh, I'm sorry, the mayor of Coral Gables, Florida, a uh, few years back during the 2016 Republican convention. Mayor of Coral Gables, Florida was a rock rib Republican. And four days into his mayorship, he changed his mind on climate change and wrote an op-ed with the mayor of Miami and published it in the, the uh, newspaper during the, uh, the convention to say Republicans need to take climate change seriously. And you know what changed his mind? It was the business owners who came to him and said, we're going to start losing money quickly. Our, our businesses, you know, the, the floods are coming, businesses are going underwater. And, and you can look this up, I kid you not, a very significant factor in convincing him was that the, the yachts could no longer get out of the harbor because the water level had risen to the extent that their masts were hitting on the bridge. That was part of what convinced him, okay? So it, to the extent to which you can go to where somebody lives, which is sometimes their money, uh, that will happen. There, there was some government official, I wish I could remember who it was, but it was some Trump appointee um, who changed his mind within a week on, on climate change, on getting the new job. I and mean, people can change their minds very Who was it? At NASA, yes. And why did he change his mind? Because he was surrounded by smart people who were patient with him and showed him the evidence. Sometimes that's all it takes. I mean, we, we could reach critical mass on this pretty, pretty quickly. I, I sometimes feel like we're going in the wrong way. I mean, when I saw the flat earth coming up, I thought, oh no. Really? Now that? Yeah, I mean, we're, we've already got our hands full with climate change. I mean, because have things gotten that bad? Um, so, so this is why I'm out there on the internet every night uh, fighting it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I wonder what you have to say about the role of religion and science denial. After all, religion is based on the denial of science. Uh, well, some, some scientists are, are religious. Um, it, it's important to remember, uh, so I, I think back to Galileo. 
Um, in one of my earlier books, uh, back in 2006, uh, called Dark Ages, I made the argument that we're currently in the dark ages of understanding human behavior. And my, my thesis was that political ideology was today doing to social science what religious ideology had done to natural science in Galileo's time. Galileo was, in fact, a very religious person. And one of the parts of his um, uh, house arrest that he fought hardest was the idea that he couldn't go to church anymore. And the Galilean principle was that he wanted to protect religion from science, not just science from religion, because he thought that they existed in separate realms. To the extent that religion tells us that we need to believe empirical things based on faith, I think it's overstepped. Uh, that's that's uh, something that, that I, I don't think is right. Uh, there, I, I guess I'm of, I'm of the opinion that uh, faith should not have a role in empirical discovery. No, but uh, the, uh, the religion is based on a belief in the supernatural. And that's the, almost the definition of it, as I understand it. Yeah. Believing in the supernatural. If you do that, what? How do you select which is supernatural and which is not supernatural? Well, uh, again, if you, if if someone is religious and they think that that's that there's evidence in the Bible, say, for the idea that the Earth is only six thousand years old, uh, that that's not credible. That that's uh, I think a, a form of science denial. Isn't every uh, a miracle? Essentially, science denial. If it's if it's, a, it's supposed to be a, a natural miracle, uh, yes. But but I'm gonna I'm gonna defend an idea here, which is that um, we don't know everything. Uh, we don't know what happens to us after we die. Now that's not an empirical question because there are no data on it. Uh, you read somebody like Dawkins, who is, you know, one of the most famous atheists in the world. He thinks that because there's no God, he says, um, that there could be no heaven, there's no afterlife. I'm not sure there's a connection between them. I think that's a kind of uh, hubris, a kind of uh, false knowledge, if you will. Uh, the argument that I make is, if you don't need God to explain this world, why do you need God to explain the next world? I mean, I'm not saying it's probable. I'm not saying I believe in it even. I'm saying that there are certain things that, that we don't know. Um, so my objection to religion is when it comes on the turf of science, when it comes on the turf of uh, uh, em empirical truths. As a source of values, uh, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to push back. I, I'm not myself a religious person, but my objection to, uh, um, my objection is really to, to ideology. My objection is to ideology as a basis for the discovery of empirical truth. That's, that's my concern. Whether it's political or religious, uh, that's, that's where I uh, part company with people. So why, aren't there, why isn't there more of a movement for things like uh, to actually put news, put information out there, like on PBS public service announcements. Why aren't scientists somehow? I don't know. Groups? I I and, I don't know why why they're not doing more. Because I know that Dawkins. I think that he put a public service announcement on a bus in England yeah. or something. So why don't we see more of that? Why don't we get information out to people? That I, I mean, it, it's hard to put yourself out there and get criticized. Um, scientists have their integrity questioned, and they're busy. They don't want to necessarily go out and do this, or maybe they think it's not a big problem. And one thing that I uh, occurred to me is they don't know what to say. If you present evidence and people just reject your evidence, what more is there to say? I think the more to say is to talk about the values of science, to talk about the scientific attitude. That's what I think they should do. But who thought of that? Who, who, who knew that they could do that? That's what, uh, so I wrote the book, at least in part, to give scientists something to say where they were not embarrassed by uncertainty, where they were not embarrassed to go out and get into these public debates and then have somebody think that it was definitive to say, well, come back to me when you've proven it. I think there's a way to push back on that. 
I think there's a way to push back on that by saying, really, you, you want it, so the one in a million shot, you're, you know, you're hanging your, your, uh, your hat on that? Uh, I, I, again, I, I think, so, I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson is out there doing it, but I, I, don't, see, uh, I don't see enough of it, and I wish more people uh, I wish more people would do exactly what you're saying. I hope that my book is going to help them to do that. Because although I criticize scientists, and some of you are scientists here, I said some kind of sharp things, I think that scientists need to own this because it's going to go in the wrong direction. And nobody has more credibility than scientists to talk about what's special about science. And I think that if they talked about the process of science, not just the results, not just the evidence, but about how the rigor with which they find what they find, I think that convinces people. I think that will increase the, the trust in the authority of science and get back to maybe where we were, though it, it's, it's not going to be easy. I think this ha uh, should be the last question. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, I'm the father of a couple of scientists, and uh, I appreciate I studied geology before studying Chinese, and glad to hear your reference to Wegener and the uh, plate tectonics. Right. And uh, I hope everyone does go up to Ada on 15th. It's a wonderful place. So I'm having a little cognitive dissonance because okay. um, I was watching uh, uh, Professor Will Happer. Is it Happer or Happner? He's with the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton Emeritus. Yep. And he was being very, uh, very critical of uh, some of the presentations of Al Gore's. And then I was seeing some of the pushback against him, and I was seeing a lot of ad hominem stuff, and I'm thinking yeah. that does not serve the cause, anyone's cause, to engage in that kind of ad hominem. I want people to address the issues and the evidence honestly. So, uh, I, I I think you're right. I mean, uh, Freeman Dyson uh, also got some of this as well. Um, I mean, there there are a small small minority of people with you know. Real scientific credentials, yeah. who Very are jobs. who who are pushing uh, against the consensus on climate change, and I think their arguments have to be taken seriously. And I had seen that argument before, uh, and kind of dismissed was he it he the fellow made the argument ago. about clouds about cloud cover? Yeah, yeah, like 20 years ago, I remember reading Alexander Co Cockburn. Well, he, here's here's the uh, so yeah. I'm a philosopher. I'm not going to stand up for ad hominem. You you you, insult, yeah. you, you attack the argument, not the person. Right. I remember reading something, though I don't remember the reference now. That uh, I, and I was I think it was a, it was a follow-up to Naomi Oreska's study. She did the original study about the the consensus of people on climate change. But there was a follow-up study in recent years where you've all heard the idea that well not, there was 97 percent consensus on climate change. And you think, oh, well, who are these other 3%? Somebody studied those 3% of papers and found that they were all methodologically flawed. Every single one of them was methodologically flawed. And as I just reported, now that, that's actually an old statistic, the 97%. It's now one out of a million. I encourage you to, to look at, uh, at the Reuters report and well, see where I, that came from. I think everyone agrees that, cli uh, that climate does change. Well... I don't think everybody agrees, and and of course the money is the money question is not just whether climate is changing, it's what's causing it. But but this happens. I mean, people what uh, new ideas um, are resisted, they're ridiculed, uh, then they're accepted. I mean, but but we don't have that much time to go through this this process. But I've watched climate change denial morph from the we're not it's not even getting hotter to, well, it's getting hotter, but we don't know why. The next thing that's going to happen is there's nothing we can do about it. Or like Bjorn Lomberg would say, well, there's things you can do that are more effective. Like yeah. Spend the money on this, but not on that. Right. Uh, uh, ultimately, yeah. does it come down to economy? Does it come down to money? I, I, don't, I don't know. But yes, I think that arguments need to be taken seriously when they've got evidence for them. That's the the court of uh, of ideas where we can uh, can uh, yeah, talk I about this. I just want to create panic among a generally scientifically illiterate population. Uh, I, I me me either. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you all.